Hi everyone, welcome to Improvisation in the Classical Era. My name is Virginia Shingleton and I'm a volunteer with the National Flute Association. The NFA was founded in 1972 as a common ground for flutists to exchange ideas and inspiration. In the years since, it has grown to become one of the world's largest flute organizations with members from all 50 states and across the globe. We invite all of you to become NFA members if you haven't already and take advantage of our year-round benefits, including a subscription to the Flutist Quarterly, borrowing privileges from our sheet music library, discounted instrument insurance, and more. Visit nfaonline.org to learn more and join today. We also like to acknowledge that today's online event is made possible with support from our members, our donors, and the Illinois Arts Council Agency. Thank you, and now I will hand it over to Dr. Nancy Williams. Hello, thank you everyone, um, and thank you to NFA for inviting me today. Uh, this is Cadenza's Eingang and More Improvisation in the Classical Era. I'm Dr. Nancy Williams. That is a clarinet in my hand. Um, I have studied flute in my master's and played flute extensively as a doubler, um, but the yeah, I'm primarily a clarinetist, and the inspiration for my research came from uh, my being a clarinetist because we don't have the Baroque traditions that other woodwind instruments have because we were late to the party. We were invented later and um, the majority of our repertoire is after the classical era, which is when performance practice changed significantly. significantly. Uh, and so as a clarinetist, I was brought up learning primarily the Mozart from the classical era, and then everything was post-classical in my repertoire after that. So when it came to uh, performance practice of the classical era, I was definitely lacking. When I was getting my doctorate, uh, I realized that um, the performance practice I'd learned for the Mozart did not really inform me to for performance practice throughout the classical era because that the Mozart to clarinetist is kind of like our Bible uh, and <laughs> people don't like to mess with it very much and I found out that that was very different as to what was going on in the world during the classical era in music uh, and my my colleagues because I was a doubler I also had jazz band experience in um, as, as a jazz saxophone player. And uh, that allowed me to kind of step out of the fear of not, uh, of not being able to play anything on, on the page. So that experience in the jazz realm empowered me to be able to do more of the improvisation in the classical era that tended to uh, intimidate and um, dare I say freak out my colleagues in the clarinet world who had never been asked to play anything off the page in that sense before. Um, and since then, uh, I so I published a book on this, oh, I don't know, er, earlier, like four, four years ago maybe. Um, and since that time in the lecture circuit and in more research, I've come to see it more from other woodwind angles that have had that Baroque uh, practice to inform them and so now I can see how the classical era uh, changed some of those uh, performance practices and improvisational practices in a unique way. Oh, by the way, our audio um, is not working today. We tried to troubleshoot that. Everything on my computer says it's working, <laughs> but it's not actually working. So I'm gonna be singing the examples today, but I know that you are very gracious. And so I appreciate your patience with that. So in this presentation, I'm gonna show you the what, why, when, and how of incorporating improvisational techniques into music of the classical period. Originally, this research was done by Dolmesh and Donenreiter musicologists, and they had a really rigid black and white interpretation, which musicology has really expanded um, its understanding since then. Uh, but a lot of those Dolmesh and Donenreiter uh, uh, followers still have somewhat of a black and white interpretation. Mainly, I want to make it clear that classical improvisation doesn't need to be overwhelming or scary. Uh, 
coming from the jazz era or the, the, the jazz pedagogy approach that I had growing up, I was given um, the ability to fail, to make mistakes, to not sound very good while I was improvising. And it was part of the process and people still clapped and they thought I was brave, brave and amazing, and so I, I did it more, and I got better. And in the classical realm, um, we're often not exposed to performance practice until much later in our careers, and then we're expected instantly to create something um, that's high quality. And I think that that's an unrealistic expectation. It was um, the inspiration um, of that divide between the two genres uh, that um, kind of forced me to go through with with my book project and the research behind that more importantly. So in addition to that impossible standard, what I think is an impossible standard for modern performers, um, because we don't come from that culture of improvisation, uh, we also don't come from the culture of learning aural skills often, not always, but often um, as we're growing up and as we're learning our instruments, as we're learning flute, we're not encouraged to uh, learn aural skills on our instrument. Uh, instead, th that often comes later when we're in college studying music and then we have theory and aural skills training there, but not necessarily with our instrument. And that also is a big divide um, from what was happening on in the classical era. Um, so I draw a lot of my inspiration from jazz pedagogy as well as the um, historical musicological pedagogy or, and um, research that I, w that I was doing. So first of all, what are classical improvisatory techniques? They're the approaches classical performers use to add to the composition. This comes out of the Baroque tradition of Baroque composers sketching out a melody and then modern performers, or not modern, but at that time, um, their performance counterparts actually finishing the composition. So you could have different performers playing the same piece and it would sound totally different because they were going off of a sketch or an outline of the melody and they were filling it in and making it their own. Um, that was from the Baroque tradition. Uh, the types of, of approaches or improvisational categories I divided into, into four elements. Ornamentation, cadenzas, Eingang and diminutions. So let's get into ornamentation first. Uh, that's the best way to start or the easiest way to start um, if you're looking at uh, adding to the melody. And this is what started me down the rabbit hole because my research um, curiosity initially was I'm not sure how to interpret some of these classical ornaments. I don't feel like I'm, I have the expertise or the knowledge to be able to play them how they're supposed to be played. And so I started my research and quickly found out that the supposed to be played part um, was what was getting me in trouble because there were many different interpretations. Uh, many more classical ornaments existed than exist today. Um, and uh, composers would sometimes make up their own ornaments. Symbols may not be a realistic uh, interpretation of what the composer wanted. For example, um, the trill symbol, which also there were tons of different symbols for, for one thing and tons of different names. Um, so very, very muddy research. The problem is not that we don't have enough information, it's that we have too much. Um, so, for example, a symbol that may not represent what the composer intended would be the trill symbol, which was often just like a, a cross type symbol. A composer could put that over a note to indicate not necessarily a trill, but this would be a good place for the performer to add their own elaboration, their, to put in their own ornament. Uh, and then lastly, 
I didn't understand that ornamentation was connected to an affect or a mood. So on the screen is um, what we're going to call a long appoggiatura. The small note comes on the beat and it takes away time from the large note. It should be performed with emphasis on the smaller note, now on the beat. Um, and the affect that's connected with that is affection. And so as um, a performer, it's important to know how not just to play that mathematically, how much to take away from the big note, which by the way varies greatly, um, but also to impart the, rec the right affect. There's, uh, in the clarinet literature, Stamitz wrote, uh, oh, let's see, what is that? This, the clarinet concerto in B-flat. And the second movement is a romance. And it contains um, various different uh, long appoggiaturas. Some of them are written out in the music as they should be for performed. Um, math mathematically, such as uh, quarter notes or eighth notes, and not using the ornamentation symbol. Some of them are written using the ornamentation symbol. And so I'm going to sing this. I want you to listen for the emphasis on that note. See if you can identify where those long appoggiatures are. Da 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 dun dun da 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 dun da dun dun da 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 dun pa dum. And one of the coolest things from this research and finding that piece where it was used in particular um, was that half of them were written in as ornaments and half of them were written in in standard notation. And as I was looking at the modern music that I was performing, I was starting to notice how many um, ornaments were being notated. And that's important because an or ornamentation is a musical gesture, not a technical one. And so the, the past was informing the future repertoire that I was looking at. Uh, and the way I was starting to think about ornaments, ornaments and how to perform them was changing, especially with knowing that they were connected to an affect. Obviously, the, the middle movement of that Stamets being a romance, the long appoggiatura was the perfect um, ornament to put in there. And as we're adding ornaments as musicians, it's important to know what that affect is to make that connection in, in, in some circumstances. So all this leads me to ornaments during the classical era were part of an improvisational culture. Musicians could add them, take them away, change them, um, and the way that, they're, that they were performed could change. Um, Eric Hopridge found two different Haydn uh, music boxes from that era. So the music that was used was the same, but the ornaments were interpreted completely differently. So this was pretty liberating as a performer. I felt a lot less stress about needing to um, be as particular as I thought that I needed to be. So I want to see if anybody has any questions about classical ornaments at this point before we go on into cadenzas. Okay, it looks like we're okay. Um, you can pop them into the chat too. Okay. Oh, please talk louder. Hi, could you please talk about ornaments in Mozart? If you haven't already. Um, so I, um, yeah, can you be a little bit more specific, Susan? No, I'm sorry. So, so one of the things, well, um, maybe I, the concertos would be good. Okay. 
Um, so Mozart is a little bit later in the classical era, um, or at least later to the part of the classical era that they were using um, improvisational techniques to their fullest. Once we get past um, 1750, which is where the start date of the classical period was kind of randomly put, um, it, it starts to deteriorate a little bit. So um, Mozart is going to be a, a little bit more, um, oh, how do I say this? If you have, um, no, but what kind of, what, what are you looking at? Are you looking at manuscript? Are you looking at um, a, a particular publisher? Uh, no, I just would like to know more about the ornaments in Mozart, that's all. Okay, so about how to, um, how to perform them? How to perform or, them, what would how be to appropriate improv. to add in, or could you add things in? Um, everything, really. Okay, so the best thing for um, an individual composer like that might be to listen to various different per recordings of not just the particular concerto you're looking at, but lots of different Mozart stuff, in particular the piano stuff, because that's where the ornamentation took its inspiration from. Okay, thank you. That's that. That would be my advice to see what other people are doing and to study Mozart scores himself. There's when we get later on in this um, presentation when we talk about diminutions and melodic elaboration. I'm going to bring up a Mozart score for one of his trios and we're going to look at how he changed the melody from um, not as an improv, not as improvisation, but within the score when he was writing it. And so you can also look at scores and look at what Mozart was writing for um, ornamentation and use and use those ideas and transfer that over. Is that helpful? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So moving on to um, Oh, I've got a glitch here. Do, do, do. There we go. Moving on to classical cadenzas. Um, so a cadenza is a chance for the soloist to improvise in the final cadence of a solo part of a movement, usually the tonic 6-4, just before the dominant. They can range from several measures worth of material to several breaths worth. There was usually only one cadenza per, per piece. So for the entire concerto, only one cadenza in one of the movements and it would reflect the style of that movement. Um, they, some of the classical cadenza myths that I found out were not true is that it had to be long. So it only needed to be a couple measures. It didn't need to be technical. It just had to reflect the mood and it didn't need to be, need to modulate. Um, there may or may not have been a fermata even. So on the screen, there's two different examples of how uh, cadenza may be notated, or it may not have any type of indication at all. And where the cadenza was, um, as far as which movement it was in, was left totally to the performer to decide. Um, performers could write out their own cadenzas ahead of time they could use suggested ones. They had um, collections of books of, of cadenzas. They'd be organized by like flash, fast or slow, um, I mean, in regards to the movement that you were looking at. Uh, so did the cadenza need to be for a fast movement or a slow one or a major movement or a minor one? And 
then you had people who were also improvising on the spot. Whether you chose to write it out ahead of time or um, use, use a suggested one or like they had back then a book. Sometimes those are written in for us uh, or improvised it on the spot. They needed to sound improvised. So this is an example of an anonymous concerto, uh, concerto uh, clarinet concerto in D major. It's the first movement, which was fast. And I'm going to sing it for you just to demonstrate that it doesn't need to be uh, very long and it doesn't need to be very technical and it doesn't need to modulate. Da 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 And so hopefully that makes it a little bit more accessible. Before we move on, does anybody have any questions about cadenzas? Okay. So let's move on to Eingang. You may have heard Eingang. Eingang is the singular. Eingang is plural. And um, this is a term that was coined by Mozart. I prefer calling them lead-ins uh, because that's what they do. They lead into the recurring theme. Uh, they, uh, it's a cadential embellishment that occurs at the end of a phrase and um, it's used to lead into an upcoming theme, often the return of a theme. So rondos, very common. In fact, this is um, a Stamitz Bassett Concerto in F major that's on the screen and it has uh, three different Ein gang that are leading into the upcoming rondo theme. So the rondo theme is da 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 da, and then it goes on from there. So the first one, uh, the fermata is on the last note, da, and the performer added da 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 da, or rather could add because these were Stamitz's suggestions that he put in this in the manuscript. So all total it would be da 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 da. The next one was a little bit longer. Da 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 da. And then the third one, which is actually going to be longer than the cadenza that I just played for you. Um went like this. I'm going to change keys. This is not working for my voice. Da ba ba da 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 bum bum ba ba bum ba bum 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 that last one's an octave lower bum 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 ba da da ba da 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 bum ba da 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 and so on with the theme. So just like uh, cadenzas, these may have a fermata like Stamitz has put in, or, or the publisher actually, uh, in, in what's on the screen example, or there could not be any fermata at all, at all, and the performer was expected to add these lead-ins on their own. I will say, having done this for several years now, it sounds really naked to not have any type of lead-in. When I started working with my students on this, um, even using like um, ba 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 da da some, something like that to, to fill in. The, just the simplest couple notes going into that rondo theme help to uh, kind of fill in that space. But it does sound to start, start to sound um, very strange to not have those lead-ins once you become comfortable with that. Um, so a different type of cadential embellishment uh, is um, at the end of uh, a phrase that does not lead into the next rondo theme or the next theme at all. 
Um, we're just going to call this a potential closer. It's not really on the screen. It's not super common. Um, I run into them every once in a while. I don't really use them a lot. But instead of leading into the theme, it would just make the closing cadence feel more complete. So an example of that would be Tromlet's Treaties from 1971, the virtuoso flute player. Um, the first note I'm going to sing is the last note of the phrase. And then uh, what's after that is how Tromlitz would, would close that, the cadential closer he used. Ba da 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 la 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 la. Nice and trilly flute thing. Or a different example would be ba da 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 la 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 la. To just make the, the cadence feel more complete. Both cadential closers and eingang are considered connective structural components. So, any questions about eingangs and cadential, cadential closers? Okay, I'm going to move on. Whoa! <laughs> Two, diminu diminutions, diminutions, sorry. Um, and diminutions are the same as melodic elaborations. Sometimes the name diminution is confusing um, because it, it means to make smaller when really what you're doing is adding notes to the melody. The reason I suspect it's called that is because it makes the, the beat smaller. It divides the beat into smaller uh, sections. And what diminutions and melodic elaborations do is they add to the melody. So they fill out that melody, which in the Baroque period was much sparser. Um, and in the classical period had more notes filled in. So this is, this is a spot where that Mozart trio is, where we can see what Mozart did with, um, melodic elaborations or diminu diminutions. When I first found out of these, my teacher, uh, when I first found out about these, <clears throat> my teacher told me to, to fill in the notes. So essentially just figure out what notes were in left out in between two notes and play those. But it's much, much cooler than that. Diminutions could consist of scalar patterns, leaps, repeated notes, and rhythmic changes, and performers could also simplify the melody. So back to that Mozart trio, the first line is what we hear the first time the theme comes in. Da, 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 da. Second line is later on in the piece, a couple measures later, what Mozart wrote to, to change that. Da 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 dum. So there we have in uh, the the added long appoggiatura there. Third line is another example of how he changes it because you would never play the same thing more than once. Da 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 la 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 da. So he's got it filled out, and now he adds the trill there. Fourth time. Um, when he does it again, he adds his um, characteristic syncopation there in that second measure and fills out those first couple measures as well. Fills out those first couple beats. So this is the one out of all of the improvisational techniques that you really need to have a handle on what's going on in the harmony. I have colleagues who are playing on period instruments and um, performing professionally, and they will add uh, their own ornamentation, sometimes even their own cadenzas and eingang, but this will be the thing that will scare them because you do have to know the piece that much better. And this is where my jazz training really helped. Um, Before we 
Well, yeah, yeah, let's go on from here. Jazz players have um, what we call licks, and they are the most commonly used type of improvisations, or patterns that performers would use, and they're written out. We study and play them in different keys and get them under our fingers so that if we get into trouble when we're improvising on the spot, our fingers kind of know what to do. And classical musicians have the same type of things. We call them, I call them, prescribed diminutions, and they were the most commonly used type of melodic elaborations. The screen has some that were written in it by Leopold Mozart in his Treatise on Fundamental Principles of Violin Playing. The first one, the first line would be what you might see in the music. Da, 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 da. The second line is Mozart's interpretation of that as an upward gropo. Da, 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 da. So that upward gropo pattern was used to fill in that first line. Third line is what may be written in the music. Ba, 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 ba. And I don't know why that couldn't be ba, 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 and then whatever the resoluting note is, so that you only have eighth notes there. And this is how you could fill it in with a prescribed diminution called a downward gropo. Da, 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 da. So are there any questions about diminutions or melodic elaborations? These are advanced techniques. So if you're just, if you came here because you were curious about to what to do to start, this would not be it. <laughs> you would want to start with uh, just mixing up ornamentation. Okay, so I'm going to move on into why are classical improvisatory techniques important. Why should we use them? For me, um, I believe in honoring the spirit of the times, staying true to the zeitgeist of the classical period. Um, I found that it's not only important, but uh, rewarding. I'm going to pop in the chat here. Okay, not, not seeing that. Um, Improvisation connects us to the musical culture of the time. I felt much more connected to the composers and the performers when I started using these in practice. Um, and studies show an increase in confidence and musicality when improvisation is practiced, which I had read about. I was super surprised when I started incorporating it with my private students, how the, it also improved tone and intonation. I had one saxophone student in particular who uh, was playing sharp, had uh, tried all my tricks to get her to not play sharp anymore, uh, but didn't, nothing seemed to be really connecting with her uh, until we started doing, uh, incorporating uh, not, not the improvisational techniques, but the aural skills that I had talked about on the instrument. We started incorporating those in her lesson and within just a couple weeks she came in and her her pitch was was spot on she wasn't playing sharp anymore so that made her tone much nicer overall intonation much much better uh and i was i was really shocked that it was happening it happened just between one lesson to another and so i asked her what's like what what is going on why is this so good and she said, yeah, my band director has noticed too. And I think it's that stupid stuff you're making me do at the beginning of lessons, which was the RL skills. Um, and I asked her why she thought that had helped. Cause I really had trouble believing her at that point. Not that I didn't believe her, that her impression, but that it could actually help in so little time. It, maybe at most we'd done it like three or four weeks. Um, but, uh, she said that it forced her to really listen for the first time in ways she hadn't. Oh, Susan, I'll get back. I'll get back to you in a second on that on the chat. Um, 
So it definitely increases confidence and musicality and I can speak from experience, increases tone and intonation, sometimes dramatically. And so I was experimenting with my students is essentially what I was doing. I had the research and figured that I needed to get some real life feedback as to if I could really teach classical students the way I had been taught in the jazz arena and transfer that over. Um, so once I had started experimenting with my studio, I figured I'd better put my money where my mouth was and start experimenting as a performer as well. And so I can speak to the fact that it enriches the performing experience um, in my situation quite dramatically. Uh, I, I will also talk to the audience ahead of time and let them know what's going on. Uh, depending on the audience. Obviously, if it's a, a national conference of um, professional musicians, they're, most of the time they're going to know what's going on. I might just say a few things. But the first time I tried it was actually um, for a festival, and there were a lot of people in the community that were there in the audience. The community was involved in the festival, it, it, and not just high school students um, and teachers. And so I talked quite a bit about how uh, the, what I was going to do, where I was going to do it, and that it was the very first time I'd, I'd tried this in, in live music, in a live performance, uh, and also that it was going to be the only time that it was ever going to be heard like that. So there was no other time where I was going to be playing this exactly like they heard it today because I was improvising in real time. I hadn't made decisions ahead of time. I hadn't written anything out ahead of time. Um, and as a classical musician, I was really not prepared for how much more meaningful that made the performance. I could really feel the energy exchange between myself and the audience. And um, <laughs> I was very surprised at the whoops and hollerings afterwards. Like it was, it was an electric and exciting moment. And so I really figured that I needed to start doing that more, even if it was painful, even if it was scary, <laughs> because it made the performance that much more meaningful, not just to me, but for the audience. Okay, so let's, let's quick get to um, Susan's question in the chat there, which was, what did I mean by mixing up ornamentation as a place to start? So what I meant by that, Susan, was um, when you are performing a piece that has ornamentation written in, you can uh, change the ornamentation or you can add ornaments that are not written in in different places. So for example, if you had a repeat particularly, so this, this would be how I would start with all of this. Um, I would take something that had a repeat had maybe had some uh, ornamentation in there. And the first time I would play the ornamentations as written. The second time I would go back and I would exchange those ornaments for different ornaments of my choosing. And then as you get better, you can change where those ornaments are. You don't have to put them in the same places as the composer did. Although I will say a little bit of research goes a long way with different composers. If you are looking at Bach and the people that are descendants of Bach, they tended to be a lot more rigid. And in that case, um, I wouldn't necessarily play around as much. Um, but we'll get, we'll get to the different schools in a little bit. I'm coming to that. I'll add some, I'll add some clarity to that for you. <laughs> So when is classical improvisation appropriate? You can use on music that's one to a part. If you're new to this, concertos are fair game. Um, it, once you get more experienced, I've actually done this in real time in chamber music. That is one to a part and um, that is exhilarating and a ton of fun. Uh, you can either make decisions ahead of time um, or you can uh, make decisions in real time when you're performing which is super scary and super fun at the same time and surprisingly not as hard as I would thought because classical music there's often the first person that starts with a theme and then someone comes in later with that theme and then you can just imitate 
what they've done. And it, not just with improvisation, but with um, articulation and dynamics, which are more performance practice. Excuse me. Um, most commonly, it was done from 1750 to 1800. At 1750, we have the mark of the beginning of the classical period. It was not a light switch. Um, it's just an estimate. And the classical period technically goes on until 1825. What we have happening at 1800 is a change in the piano, the way pianos were made so that they could sustain longer. Ornamentation was often used to sustain a note more. It started in keyboards. And so when keyboards didn't have to do that anymore, it, it kind of fed into instrument, other instruments as well. So um, ornamentation became not as necessary to sustain. I suspect the rise of Beethoven had something to do with it as well, and the belief in the composer as, as God figure, which started with that romantic ideal. Uh, but probably m most importantly was the rise of um, the middle class. And when you had the Industrial Revolution, you had people not having to, to work as much and were getting paid more um, so they could afford instruments and they had the time to practice them. When before that demographic um, did, was, had no industry to um, do any of their jobs. And so they were working much farther, much more, not making as much money. Rise of the Industrial Revolution, now we have a rise of the middle class that could afford instruments and could afford to practice them, but they didn't have that musical training that had been reserved for those professional musicians. So when it came to improv improvisational skills, they were lacking. And often composers didn't like what they were hearing from musicians playing their music anymore. And so they started getting more dictatorial and writing in more of the melody. Um, so so that's that's pretty much why 1800 is is again it's not a light switch but it's it's a it's a safe cutoff point if you're not sure when when you can do this safely. <clears throat> uh, the sparser the melody and the thinner the texture, the more is demanded from the performer. And anytime you have repeated measures, phrases, and sections. Those things that I thought were super boring in classical music before, now are I see as opportunities. So lastly, how do you learn to improvise? Aural skills, study, and practice is how I came about it after all of my research. Um, Aural skills training on the instrument can be applied even with beginners. I've done it with my students. In fact, beginners who don't know any better can really be impressive. I had um, a little eight-year-old student who was improvising harmonies above the melody within just a couple months of playing, <laughs> which is not the norm. Um, I found that the older the student, the scarier it is because it's not what they know. But it, it's, it's shocking how in just a couple minutes at each lesson, it can make a really big difference. Um, imitation, call and response, adding harmony to melody. Um, Christopher Azara has a line of products that focus on aural training in general using folk songs. But if you're a teacher here that's interested in using this in your studio, please understand that this can be really scary for students and it's important that the teachers can demonstrate this and provide a culture where students can make mistakes and students can be vulnerable and still feel safe. John Hopkins did a study on jazz musicians and um, hooked their brains up to, to computers while they were improvising and the data clearly showed that 
the improvisational while, while these people were improvising the judgment part of their brain was not working and so you could surmise from that that judgment can't exist at the same time as improvisation so that's important to remember not only as a teacher but as a performer if you're trying to judge what you're doing at the same time as you're doing it that is a sure recipe for um, crashing and burning what one of the things I did was record myself and that was really helpful ahead of time and then when you're if if you're if you're doing it in real live performance don't let yourself think whether it's good or bad because that will slow you down um, there are resources to help with period practices um, there are some of the quants maybe what you're familiar with sometimes pronounced quants outside of, of Germany um, and there are several modern method books that have been written uh, some professionals are now making recordings with improvisation uh, and you can listen to accompaniment as well as record yourself. Or sometimes there's um, accompaniment CDs that you can buy. And that, those are really great opportunities to just experiment and then and, and see what you can come up with on the fly with those. So not only do you need to understand the cultural and historical imp importance of culture of improvisation, yeah, the culture of improvisation, um, students and teachers know, need to know the generalities particular to the instrument, piece, and composer. Uh, and this is where people can sometimes get scared that they're doing something wrong. Because um, there wasn't the international community like we have now with the internet and being able to talk to each other. There were lots of different practices. Improvisation practices could vary from country to country, from school to school. Uh, and this is what I was talking about, Susan. There was um, the Berlin School, which tended to be very rigid, there, but still in Germany, there was the Mannheim School, which was much more accepting of uh, more improvisation. And then there were the French and Italian schools, which were totally different in how they uh, approached improvisation. So, but to show you how muddy the research is, you could, within those contexts, have different composers who are teaching it differently. Um, the Cavants, I know, is really popular in the flute world, as, as it should be, but then you have to ask yourself, was, was he really practicing what he was preaching? How many teachers do you know who teach one thing but actually do a different thing? So we don't really know the accuracy of the quants. In, in there he says uh, that um, cadenzas should be pray, played in an improvisational fashion, should not be metered, but then within there he actually has metered cadenzas as examples. <laughs> and so there's, there's lots of um, inconsistencies. And when you look at coming from the Baroque period, and the traditions of rebellion that ha tend to, to happen with um, new performers coming in and rebelling against the old style. You look at some of those Baroque rules, and I remember, so one of the Baroque rules is that um, the, the note you trill on is gonna start with the note above unless it's in a sequence. So if you have a sequence of trills, then the note's gonna start on, on the main note, and you're gonna trill up from there. Well, in the classical era, I found um, a teacher saying, well, everybody does it that way. Wouldn't you want it to sound new and fresh and different? Why, why would you want to always start on the bottom note in a sequence of trills? So it's, it's very muddy research. Um, I'll get to your question there in a second. Uh, Susan, I see that. Um, and to add to that, you could have a German composer writing in the French style. So which improvisational style is that going to be? Is it going to be the German style of improvisation? Is it going to be the French style of improvisation? You had um, Italian teachers teaching in Paris. Is, are, what type of improvisation are they teaching their students? So although Dolmush and Dannenreuter started out wanting to give us concrete advice on how to do this, the reality of it is, is that um, 
we don't know a lot. And it's very, very muddy research. And when you look at all the contributing factors, um, it's, it's not black and white. So um, the moral of the story for knowing generalities is that it's a good example if it's a high profile composer to maybe do a little research or listening, like I suggested to Susan to, Susan, to see what other people doing are doing. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, are you going to um, do this on period instruments or are you going to do this on your modern flute? And if you do it on your modern flute, are you going to use the um, range and key work inhibitions from a classical flute? I come I, I believe that um, it's not important to be as historically accurate as to buy a, a, a classical flute. I think that's limiting for a lot of people, and I think the culture of improvisation is more important. It's more important to stay true to that. Um, and I also, although I, I respect um, the classical instruments and their limitations, I think that we are in a unique situation with modern performers and modern instruments to be able to do more than they could. And I think that had they had that opportunity, they would have well. But if you want to add that extra challenge, the world is your oyster. Um, so Susan asked, where can you get accompaniment CDs? Um, shoot, I think I just Googled. There's Music Minus One is one of the companies that used to do that. Um, and then sometimes Method Books will have accompaniment CDs, uh, like solo compilations. Sometimes those will come with CDs or, or you can uh, register online. But if you can't find those, you can always pay someone pay a pianist to record the accompaniment for you. So um, before we have a chance to, to talk about uh, or, or to answer some questions, I do want to leave you with, as performers, we have an obligation to the music of the time to create a meaningful cultural connection. For me, the benefits of classical improvisation far outweigh the risks and the fear um, I talked about how muddy this is, how it's not black and white, and that scares a lot of people off. But I think that uh, performers should give themselves permission to uh, make mistakes and create something imperfect as you begin incorporating improvisation. Because the train of study has been broken, the rules conflict constantly, stylistically good improvisation was subjective even then, and no recordings exist. So instead of being afraid of doing something wrong, I think that the, the lack of all those things gives it liberty for modern performers so that we have freedom um, because we don't have recordings. We don't know actually what was really done. Both audiences and, and students alike will be inspired by the increased incitement, excitement and inti intimacy created <clears throat> excuse me, when improvisation is included. So this is my why. Um, to be true to the music of that time, to create a meaningful cultural connection. And that's what I go back to when I get scared, when I feel overwhelmed, um, and it is, it has not served me wrong. So if you can find a why that is meaningful to you as a performer, um, that will carry you through the fear, because it can be scary doing something new, trying something new, um, and is particularly, particularly improvisation, um, if you're starting from scratch. Uh, but it gets better. You know, be your own cheerleader. Keep, keep, have that curiosity and learner's mindset, uh, and then have a why beyond um, 
thinking that you should do it because it's required of you. I think that will make a ton of difference. Um, and lastly, vulnerability is about showing up and being seen. Thank you, Brene Brown. It's tough to do that when we're terrified about what people might see or think. So you have to shut that judgmental brain down when you're doing it in practice. Save that for when you're going over listening to your recordings. Um, and I will say that this has given me an insight into music, not just of the classical period, but as I said, it's, it's informed how I play modern music today. And I firmly believe it's, it's worth the effort. So um, I would love, love, love questions. That is honestly my favorite part of these presentations. So please ask no question. No question is stupid. So one of the questions I will um, occasionally get asked is if cadenzas need to include themes, like a theme from the movement. Um, the one place I saw proof of that was in Mozart when he was performing, he was writing out his cadenzas ahead of time. Um, but that was not always the case. Mozart, um, the, Mozart <laughs> was not a normal person. <laughs> um, so I don't know how much that was being done. I think because we have these books of prefab cadenzas, that those collections, I think th that um, we can safely say themes were not the norm. Okay, questions in the chat. Oh, yes, Susan, I am actually getting more into Mozart. Maybe you could come back and do a Mozart class is Susan's question. I am getting more into doing Mozart um, and learning more about him specifically because that's something that's been coming up throughout these presentations. So I'm on it. Um, what problems do older students most often encounter when learning classical improv for the first time and how do you approach them in lessons? So. I'll give you an example of a high school student I had, a very accomplished, getting the highest chairs in all state band, and I had him soloing on a concerto, and I could not get him to just play a couple notes of a lead-in or an eingang before the return of a rondo theme. I couldn't get him; like he he would not do it. Um, and this was not a student who was usually um, timid. And so that's when I started incorporating aural skills in my lessons, or rather figuring out how to solve that problem, because I felt like I was not serving them well if they, did, if they weren't even brave, brave enough to play a couple notes off of the page. Um, so how I approach it in lessons with beginners is they just don't know any different. I mean, I start with mouthpiece, um, mouthpiece work, um, call and res not call and response, but, but modeling, um, and, and work that in as we put the instrument together. And that's how we warm up every day. So they're doing RL skills training, not every day, every lesson, um, at the beginning of each lesson, but just like for a minute or two. It's just part of our warm ups. And then as they get older, um, I'm transferring that over into scales and into duets and safer places like that, and then into solos. When I have an older student, like that student I was giving the example of, um, who is um, doesn't, doesn't have that tradition of aural skills building, I'll do more of what I talked to Susan about earlier, which is uh, incorporating ornamentation, first of all. Um, and uh, changing things just a little bit on repeats. And I might even start with more performance practice as opposed to improvisation. So changing articulation or dynamics on the repeat just to get them more comfortable. But I'm a firm believer in um, starting with, starting with warm-ups and then incorporating that into a safer place 
into lesson material. Um, and then take the next logical step is then incorporating that into solos that they're that they're playing for the public. Um, because because it's 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 just so darn scary otherwise <laughs> if you don't build some type of foundation. So that that's how I work with my older students. Um, what do you say to a student if they push back on improvisatory exercises? How do you make them comfortable? So yeah, I kind of covered that. Um, it, it, they don't know their improvisatory exercises to begin with. Uh, and if they hadn't have it, haven't had another teacher, they don't know any different. Um, obviously it's different when you get into higher education. You can have those conversations more. Uh, and I can't emphasize culture enough. You really have to create a safe place for them where it's okay to make mistakes. And one of the one of the things that I will do is I, I will do it first. And sometimes I've gotten better now <laughs> in the beginning when I was doing it. I was I had some clams in there. I had some things that didn't sound right, but that was that was good for them to hear that I was making mistakes. Now that I've gotten better, I actually throw in some mistakes or things that don't sound great just to kind of make them more comfortable. Obviously, I wouldn't do that like in a higher education setting, but with younger students, um, it's you have to really build up that bravery uh, and get them to know that, um, create a safe space for them in your lesson studio that is strong enough that they can take that safe place out onto the stage with them. That's a great question. Okay, any more questions? I'm trying to think if I had any more that are asked of me. So, so when I was doing these experiments on my students, I created a part in my method book on what worked with them and how I started looking at it, um, how I kind of streamlined that and then used that to teach myself. <laughs> um, and then I went through from a research perspective, because I had the research before I had the functional skills, uh, and then went through and uh, a concerto and made like rational research-based decisions behind where I'm going to improvise. Now I don't do that so much. Now I'm a little bit more liberated. Um, but thank you so much. I'm so glad you're interested in this. Uh, and thank you so much, National Flute Association, for having me here today. Oh, yes, Susan. What method book are you talking about? You said my method book. Did oh, you write yes. a method so, book? I, I did. Um, uh, if you go to drnancywilliams.com, drnancywilliams.com, um, you can find out about it. But it it's essentially was a series of different graduates, uh, doctoral projects that I had, um, starting with the ornamentation, like an ornamentation paper that turned in, when I realized that was improvisatory, turned into, oh, what really is classical improvisation? And then the aural skills builder with your instrument, and then like how I made decisions on a cadenza. And I put my bibliography in there, um, and as many resources, um, actual resources of music scores that I could find uh, in an in a anthology. So that's where you can find it. And that's, that's where all my research was. I actually made it more for myself because I found that I was getting bogged down in how, how the volume of material there was. And so it was a way for me to remember how to do it. <laughs> and then one of my teachers started handing it out to his students. So I figured I, it had a, a use for beyond, beyond my own use. Okay, thank you very much. All righty, I'll go ahead and close this out. All right, thanks again to Dr. Williams, and thank you everyone who attended today's online event. A recording of this event will be published on the NFA YouTube channel later this week. 
If you'd like to see the schedule of our upcoming online events, visit nfaonline.org forward slash events. To learn more about other news and events, be sure to follow us on social media at NFA Flute or visit our website at nfaonline.org. Thank you again.